down. I see a, we get a lot of requests at Pythia for projects where I've had three real estate projects come to us and they say, we want to build a really massive building and we want to put tokens against it. And I've got some defining criteria that, that we use and we'll go through them. But if there's no data store, should you be using a blockchain? If you're not storing and moving data, transactions, why would you use a blockchain? It's actually slower, it's less efficient, and there are plenty of times when a central authority will work. This is where you want to do your market analysis. How big is the market, right? Is anybody, Kevin? In the case of real estate, it would depend on what the token's utility is. If the utility is a security, then it makes sense, right? And so that would be a use case for where there isn't necessarily a large data store, but a data store of who the shareholder is. So that would be a situation where that, that's a good That's a good example of where it would be. And there's lots of opportunities for things like stable coins to do that as well. Venezuela's uh, putting their... Uh, Petro, which is their coin, against the value of a barrel of oil. That makes a ton of sense. Just to build on that for a second, with um, assets like that, you also bring liquidity to illiquid markets in the case of uh, real estate as well. You do, but is it a blockchain project? Kevin's made a good point. I don't, I don't think so, like, you know, from there, but actually leveraging it in some way to create tokens based on that asset. Yes. Yes. But not a blockchain business per se. Right. Yeah. And, okay, and, that, that, <laughs> and that's the difference. No, that's a really good point. And what we want, right, these four or five days that everybody's here, we're here to make you, everybody who's standing up is here to make you successful. Come and find us. Come and talk to, to us, to the reflective guys, Nash, Mike, Greg, everybody. This is about making you successful. So, um, but... My favorite is, where's the earnable token? Where's the transaction happening? What is, what is being done to move the value? Because remember, the, transact the tokens themselves actually end up becoming commodities, right? They have a value by themselves, which goes up. Rock is trading about 114 this morning, which is goodness. But we don't want it to go sky high through the roof and go back to where we were with Ethereum at the beginning of the year, 1.2 million transactions uh, the beginning of January, four bucks 15 to do an Ethereum transaction. That kind of becomes a non-starter if you're doing small transactions. If you're moving around 1,000 ETH or more, that's fine. But what then happens when the transactions are too expensive uh, to store some data, to keep a contract running, uh, all of those things. So where, where is the earnable token? Where is a trans set of transactions occurring that we can see liquidity in the market? And what are, who are the parties that need to agree or collaborate? And I'll come back to this a little more, but let me say this now. There's a lot of really great aspirational projects. And one of the things that we're focused on at Pythia is the picks and shovels and the groundwork for today. There are going to be a lot of great healthcare projects, insurance, retail, that are going to change the way we do business. You know, blockchain is the internet of value, but it's also not internet bacon, right? Not everything is better with it. I don't know where the mic went. So I can think of uh, like uh, use cases which might be interesting for Pythia, like for example, wallet providers. Uh, they don't necessarily use blockchain per se, that they're like actually using the blockchain, but they're providing a service so that people can interact with the blockchain. Like, would you consider these projects also, or is it for you, no, you're not using blockchain, or you're not using database, no? So, so we have to get into specifics. Let's come back to it at the end. But, all right. And then, then talk us through it. Because wallets, I'm all in. Right? That's our first fund, and we'll talk... We'll talk more about this. And then satisfy. How are you going to execute? 
So if you're coming to us with a plan, right, and we'll help you with some of it, but how are you going to get it done? Do you have a good management team? Do you, do you have a thought through plan? Do you have 12 months of financials? All of those kinds of, of good things um, that happen. So this is a real world project. CIDA is owned by the airline industry who flies. <laughs> you know, sometimes you gotta ask and sometimes I'm comedy, right? So they were founded by the airline industry and I've been talking to them. I spoke at their event, uh, the, air, the airport event last month. And most of the tech that you see in airports over the last 40 years in one form or another is coming from them. So they're owned by the governments. Everybody who's touching your piece of air travel, whether it's the government issuing TSA certificates, the airline, the people in, who are moving your baggage, the actual uh, uh, concessions in the airport, et cetera. But what they're working on is simplifying and making air travel more secure. So what they're trying to do is collect biometric data store it, and then take permissioned information. So who came from overseas? So we've got, we've got a couple of people who came from overseas. Taking that information, putting it onto the blockchain with your permission, transferring it to the airport by permission means that you can use things like zero-knowledge proofs to push your, your information through, and it's secure. Nothing needs to be shared. The, the entire ID doesn't need to be shared. It becomes more secure, and you can also enforce things like right to be forgotten, which becomes an interesting question on the blockchain, right, where you can use uh, a token to do that. But the idea is that the information can be pushed across and help you look at it. So think about all of the things that that would allow you to do um, once, once you've got that information, and then you can share it. In the R-Chain world, these would be two separate namespaces. And you could collapse one, potentially, or create one, uh, and potentially destroy it on a per-trip basis, say, for everybody on a flight. And think about how those things would, would happen. Thousand eighteen. Right, a lot of words on the chart, and I'll, I'll post this online, you can look at it. We're heading into what I would call a once in a century event. Uh, current US government has uh, freed up, put a tax on, however you wanna look at it, that's allowing billions of dollars to be repatriated into the United States. What does that mean and why do we care? For other companies that are non-tech, maybe not caring. But these companies that are heavily invested in the, technolo in the technology world, into what we're doing, are going to have a lot of money coming back in the form of billions of dollars and getting shareholder dividends and paying off debt to, to those folks is not super interesting. What's going to be interesting is what are you buying into next? What's the R&D? And Apple is a huge consumer spend company. So the reason I'm pointing this out is that as because you think about the kinds of blockchain projects that you want to give in, these are the people who are going to be spending money. So just pointing out some of the, the different aspects of where the money will come from, this is where we're looking. And this is one of the reasons why we talk to a lot of enterprises, because they're looking at things like food safety, supply chains, and how they can enable them. Microsoft is getting $130 billion alone in repatriation, $132 billion. You know, there's some taxes that they're gonna end up paying on it, but this is what they're gonna be looking at investing. The top technologies, blockchain, they're not in any order, AI, VR, and for each of them, VR and IoT, all have very strong uh, blockchain use cases. So those are some of the things that, that we're going to start seeing. So we talked a little bit about token economics. Some of the other things that we look for, or 
or questions that you should ask is, especially with an existing business, how do you get data into the blockchain? How is it going to get loaded that first time and how is it going to be maintained going forward? Does it require a consortium? One of the bigger and more interesting things that, I, that as I, as I mentioned, uh, I talked to one of the beverage manufacturers. They're really concerned about sugar. And they look at it from all of the farms that they collect to uh, the carriers, to the distributors, their own manufacturing facilities, and then all the way out uh, to the retailers. Walmart, as you probably all know, is one of the bigger use cases that already exists for pork products. So there are lots and lots of of these cases, but that requires a lot of people to agree to put the information and the data in. So as you're thinking about building your use cases and about building the data, ask yourself how this is going to get. And we've got resources to help you this. And then once it gets in there, how are you going to analyze the data? Because once it's in, you've got a lot of really rich and interesting information. Uh, does it perform at the speed of our business? Our chain is addressing a lot of the speed questions. But honestly, if you're doing international money transfer, 45 minutes is lightning fast compared to the way that most of the world works now or has worked for the last uh, five or 10 years. And what are the intermediaries that it's removing when, when you're looking at it? And when I say follow the money, it's not about how much are you going to make or what it is, but where is money being taken out of the system? Where is cost being taken out? So if you're, changed, you're getting rid of all those fax machines and places where people are doing handoffs, somebody was getting minimum wage, $25, $30, whatever, an hour to do that and to change those transactions and be able to say, we no longer need those people. They can be repurposed to do something else. Questions? Okay. So for us, life is pretty simple, right? It's really easy to figure out what we do. We've got two metrics, the number of deals and the assets under management. And that's, so that's how we sort of base everything that we're doing. We always look for good deals, how we measure the teams, how we report back to the, the shareholders uh, and, and try and keep life pretty simple. Um, as I said earlier, ideas are 10% execution. And right now we're looking at foundational things. I've talked about our, our first fund. There'll be, there'll be many others that we do and we're looking at things like payments. But for now, everybody needs a wallet, identity, exchanges. Uh, we've talked to a couple, we've brought one forward. We got the rocks listed on altcoin, which is an atomic swap exchange. If you haven't seen it, their uh, testnet is live. I'll put out the link again. It is a very slick interface. Uh, we look to create sustainable advantages within the portfolio, which means that we create synergies amongst the portfolio companies. Uh, as you know, we took an investment in Life ID. We've already got, and, and obviously it's not built, it's being built on our chain. Uh, we've already enabled three new partners for them. And we look for limited partners, other people to co-invest. It's also about people who are helping us uh, grow and build the our chain ecosystem and everything else we're doing. Uh, risk is something that you've got to quantify. So as we bring that in, we look at what does risk look like? Because everybody measures risk, especially from a partner or an investor standpoint. How is that done? Um, and it's experience that, that brings this in. Uh, deal process is pretty simple. We look for you to get an introduction to uh, one of the managing directors who looks after funds. They do some initial screening, quick process of discussing with you, your management team, where are you going, what's next. Presentation to the, the core team uh, that's usually live. And what we've done is we've, you know, lesson learned from having done this for many years is that we give everybody a template and there are basically 10 questions that you need to answer to fill out and say, you know, what problem are you solving? What's your addressable market? Does everybody know what addressable market is? 
because I've used that term, or do I, or should I go through it? I should go through it, thank you. Um, so if you think about a Kindle, everybody in the world could use it, right? 7.1 billion people. But if you're building a product in Seattle or in any part of the United States that starts to say, you know what, we're gonna limit our initial approach to people just in the United States. 371 million people at this point, but then you start looking at people who are reading age and you start narrowing it down, say six, six years old and above, who can afford the price point of this product. By the time you're done, and I've done the math and, and I've got some online examples, you end up with about 70 million people, which is a much smaller, reasonable, and, and question, how are you gonna address that market? And it's, it's unreasonable to say, we could get 100% of that, but with this process and these methods, let's say we can get 20 to 25% over the next three to five years. That's a really interesting thing to be able to look at and to present to anybody and say, this is the market that we're gonna look at. We then look at performer, your numbers, how are you gonna spend the money? And after you're done with that, if you don't have an 18 month runway, then there's a question mark. What we find it most often, and I've been doing um, investments on both sides for 25 years, is people generally don't ask for enough money. They go, well, if we ask for too much, they're probably gonna turn us down. And what we wanna see is that you've done a burn rate that gets you to about 18 months. It depends. There's a lot of things in a comfortable manner. We don't wanna see on the over, overboard side, but if you're not getting to a number that's going to get you to some kind of minimum viable product, or a place where you've got customers, or you've got customers and you can demonstrate some multiple of growth, those are really important. And then due diligence, we're gonna go do a deep dive into contracts, employment agreements, because there's a lot of IP, intellectual property, that's out there. And if you're working with a lot of contractors, What's your agreement with them before they become employees? Because sometimes you can't afford to, to bring people in full time and people keep their day jobs. That's, that's the reality of a startup. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, we're, we're looking at foundational things. We like boring, right? Razor blades, it's an overused metaphor but at the end of the day, people buy a lot of them. They came up with a unique model. Unilever bought them for a billion dollars. That's less boring. You know, the idea being that things that have lots of transactions, identity, wallets. Um, one company came, us, came to us with invoicing. Again, not super interesting, but it's got legs. Millions of people use it and do it every day and need to do it. Those are the things that are gonna make our chain, not demonstrate our chain scalability, it's gonna demonstrate the fact that your, your business can and will grow because lots of people are gonna use it. Then we can talk about things like transforming healthcare and putting electronic medical records on the blockchain, to get everybody to agree to do that, to get over the HIPAA requirements, the government is going to take time. Do I think we'll get there? Absolutely, absolutely. But the first healthcare company that we're talking to, they're an AI health company, sorry, an AI healthcare company, and all that they're doing, which I think is a brilliant stroke, is putting data sets on the blockchain, because the researchers, and the companies that they work with can't get enough data sets. You'd think that big research organizations could get them, but they don't. And putting that onto the blockchain reduces cost, it increases the speed, because it's a, it's a speed to market in the drug industry, in the, re, in the healthcare research industry. So the faster they can do it, we like things that are very simple and have a lot of scale. Any questions? I have 
several people I want to contact about bringing to you, and I'm internal to this whole process since I'm part of our chain, but uh, I'm also not very tech savvy, and uh, that's an advantage actually because I deal with a lot of CEOs who themselves are not tech savvy. And so the last thing in the world you want to do is embarrass them. So what I am going to be in the position of doing is saying, hey, you need to do this, but here's the guy you need to talk to. I'm not going to exchange a whole lot of my knowledge because it doesn't exist. So um, I guess one of the questions I have is I have a few companies in mind to bring to this. And my assumption is, and may be wrong, is that companies of certain size, of lar larger companies, already have been hit by all the various uh, people in this sector and have people yammering at them and pulling on their sleeve. Um, and so what, first of all, do we have some sort of um, advantage that we can use in, that pro in the selling process when I go to them and say, no, 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 you need to talk to us, not them. And um, uh, then secondly, and this is a little bit different, is that there are people I know in various industries who want to do something on the blockchain, but they want to do something different than what they're doing now. So it's a combination of things they've been doing with some other people who have been doing similar things. One of them, for instance, is a wine guy I told you about. Right. So he deals with a consortium of Chianti producers in Italy. There's 30, people's, 30 uh, companies in this consortium. And um, I can see all kinds of uh, problems that could arise from 30 companies in Italy uh, having to deal with each other. So uh, I'm assuming there's something to be solved there. And also there's a lot of money in it. They have a $10 million advertising budget here in the U.S. alone. So um, how do I bring someone like that to you without, without exposing my own ignorance? It's, it's simple. And we'll, we've got okay. tons of information about our chain. So your first question is, how do we bring that forward? Right? And you can start with, it's a third generation blockchain that has some unique advantages. I'm not necessarily the guy to talk to you about it, but let me introduce you to the people who are. And you know, the, the advantage, you know, one of Pythia's unique differentiators is that we have people who've launched a lot of tech startups. I've, you know, I've also launched a lot of large enterprises. So when we talk about mature and existing companies, you know, I've done Discover Card, Motorola, help them launch their smartphone. The coupons that you get every day, right? It shouldn't be a pitch about me, but it is, is something that I've done so that you can say to them, We're, I'm bringing you to a trusted group and a trusted group of technologists who are building our chain and are bringing that to market. And so you're getting, you're getting those things. Right? And that's one of the things that we do a little bit differently. As I look at companies, uh, the team looks at them two ways. Concept stage companies that have interesting ideas and then existing companies that are looking for transformation in their industry. And we've talked to a number and we're looking at an investment in two companies that have an existing product and either they're bumping their heads on some other blockchains and said, we need something better or different, or they're, they're a software company, usually around 10 to $30 million, uh, sometimes smaller, that have said, hey, we want to adopt blockchain, we want to refactor what we're doing, and we can help them as an on-ramp to our chain. So those are, great, those are great opportunities for us and to get them into the ecosystem family. So this is uh, just a little overview of what we've got. Uh, the second company we will be announcing next week, they are actually presenting this week, so they'll be uncovering uh, what they're doing and the investment at one of the security summits. So that one's done. Life ID, Chris Boscolo is here if you haven't met him. Um, he's kind of taller, very, very short haircut and gray beard. Um, come find him. Our geographic focus, primarily North America, but uh, I've traveled most of the world uh, and I'm bringing in companies from India and other places. When we do an investment, we look at what, they, what the industry calls a significant minority, 10 to 15% equity. So let me pause. Questions? How much more time do we have? My clock is... 
Finish. So we're not, so we look at it, the media and entertainment companies that we target, we're, we're looking for companies that bring something that's transformational in the industry. Storage, what could you do uh, with songs, media that, that's being brought in? There are obviously lots of different uh, areas and opportunities that, that we look at. out here because we're in conversation about setting up what we're calling the first music festival media company that we want to try and build it on the blockchain. And my intention of coming here is to meet potential developers, CTOs, and people to invest into this property that we're going to be launching. Um, we're going to be staging this massive festival in Los Angeles on June 1st and 2nd, 2019. So we're in the process of building up the team around it. So I would like to have a deeper conversation with you around that because we're talking about how ticketing, ticketing will move, media content, publishing rights when new content is created on site and through cross-cultural collaborations with musicians around the world. So <clears throat> let me give away some stuff because we've tried to give away as much as, as we have here. Let me digress for one second. We're also doing working groups. So we're building standards. Ed is running the first one on identity and what they're doing is building the protocols and giving them away with companies like Sovereign, Life ID, Verify, Trusted Key, uh, a couple of others. We want to seed people the idea. Tickets, you probably know this better than, than I do, but I've talked to a number of festival venues. Everybody has problems with tickets. Everybody has problems uh, managing the VIP area because paper tickets are a problem. So that's a really interesting area. And if you bring those things forward, how do we solve it on the blockchain? Right? What's being brought out? Where's their additional value? Those things become super interesting. Thank you. What's your name? Fabian. Fabian. Thank you. Other questions? We want to get it for, for the audience at home. Hi, uh, Michael Guadarrama. Uh, so I have a similar question. Uh, what, uh, what ideas, properties are you looking at from the fintech world? So things that come up, come to us from the fintech world are payments, stable coins. Uh, again, it's really the things that are foundational to doing this. I'm looking for someone to come and build another wallet for us. We need more than one. I mean, if anybody's got a solid idea for wallets, wallet, in my opinion, is the killer app for blockchain. Because the wallet experience for people in here is probably mediocre. For the rest of the world, it's a non-starter. To be able to do a full round trip there in fintech, and I know it sounds really simple, uh, that's one. Gaming. Online gaming is the first place that you know tokens and transactions started. If you look at what uh, Linden Labs is doing with Second Life and Sunset, I think is their next generation of platform. Those are super interesting. We've talked to a couple of game companies that are not quite ready, but that kind of token economics uh, that's being used is really interesting. Oh, you've got it. Yeah. Um, See, so yeah, I, I was wondering, are, are you also, is Pythia also interested in uh, maybe less standard investments, so something along the lines of like a blockchain studio or venture studio? accelerators? Um, are you interested in supporting any of those ventures that would be either our chain centric or uh, would support any of the specific working groups um, that you guys are putting together? I know you have ID right now. I'd actually be interested to know if you have specific thoughts on them on other working groups, but that's a separate question. Sure. So is, is the question, would we invest in development studios and incubators? Yes, I'm all in. I mean, we're, we're really, really interested in that. Every project that we do has to use our chain, right? That, that should be clear. But we know that there are going to be existing businesses and there are businesses that are already on Ethereum. They may be adopting Stellar or something else. We're totally interested in those, but it's got to have an R chain play, right? That's, that's part of the mission, right? And the, the deals and the assets under management. Any other questions?
So given the, the current, and this is a great question, thank you. What's your name? Steve. Um, the regulatory ambiguity, how does that in, impact the investments? Kind of not at all and maybe a little. If they're planning an ICO after we take an investment or they're in one, we're going to look really strongly and heavily at how they're doing that. But otherwise, blockchain projects are blockchain projects and nobody cares. And just my own personal soapbox, if you follow me on LinkedIn, right, you see I pretty much write about this stuff every day. The QR code is to my LinkedIn profile. Um, governments don't care about blockchain. Actually, they really like it, and they're some of the biggest adopters. They don't care so much about crypto. They care a lot about fraud and scams. So if you're bad actors, if you're going out, there's a blockchain, there's an ICO that went and ripped off its own employees, and when the feds came calling, they said, it was them. You got to be kind of dumb to do that. So if you're, we're going to look really carefully at companies that are doing that. One or two of the investments that, that we've made have already decided to put off any kind of token sale or ICO. Great question. Do I see an do I see uh, an ICO creating uh, concerns for subsequent rounds? We go in for in equity, so we're not doing token swaps, um, and we're looking at other capitalization structures when when we take an investment. So it's less of a concern to us, but we're actually working with and hiring economists to look at what happens when somebody's token goes from a dollar or a dollar twelve to a thousand dollars. Or if you do a token swap, right, it's not out of the realm of possibility. And and revs, we hit the date, right? And we're all standing there in December and we watch it and it does even ten thousand transactions a second. And the rev hits a thousand dollars. And we've given someone a hundred thousand tokens. They're now sitting on a hundred million dollar treasury. Most startups don't get money like that. And you gotta scratch your head and see what's gonna happen. We own a large chunk of the company, or we own 10 to 12% of it. Those are questions, nobody really has an answer for that. I know a lot of VCs, their um, uh, coin, Coinbase, uh, Coindesk has had a couple of articles on it, and some VCs are, are writing about it and saying we're not, you know, we're, we're putting language in to prevent it. You know, I, I think it's too TBD, but that's why we look for investments and positions the way we do. So, good question. So, I got time for one, maybe two more questions. Testing, there we go. Would you mind speaking a little bit about the type of companies that are currently built on our chain? Well, today our chain is still being built. Uh, so right now we've got two companies that have committed to doing that. Kevin, can I put you on the spot? Can I put you on the spot? How many companies is Reflective got? Because the question was how many are being built on? So I'm assuming you're getting the same commitments we are. How many companies have you got committed? So five to eight. So, so let's look at it as by the end of this week, we should have 10, 12 companies committed to building on a platform that doesn't exist, but there is faith in the developers in this community, in the business people that are circulating here uh, so that there's this, the best answer I can give you. But thank you for asking. One more question. Awesome. All right, well, I'll be around. I've got uh, plenty of time. Please stay for Ed's talk. Thank you for spending an, thank you for spending an hour with me. Anybody at home, peace out, thank you.